they had left in the Pacific or at the training establishments in the United States. Well, 25 years hardly seems a very long time to remember and recall when some of the memories of World War II are so vivid in your mind, even today. We were a very young, aggressive group at the time. Uh, the old man, so to speak, uh, being all of 26 years old, directly out of the Pacific from the 19th Bomb Group, and the youngest pilot in the group, 21 years of age. Yet we were an experienced organization, eager, aggressive, and surprisingly, not many of us knew the importance of why we were there. The daylight air offensive was based on the big punch and firepower of the Flying Fortress. This aircraft, which carried a crew of 10, was considered capable of flying high to its target and defending itself with 12 heavy caliber machine guns. When a group of fortresses flew in a box formation, its firepower was believed enough to beat off any attack. The Northern bomb site was considered the most precise in the world, and it was claimed that the bombers could hit a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet. The first tentative raids in daylight were flown against targets in France. German fighters made probing attacks and studied the characteristics of this threatening opponent. had established the striking power of a thousand bomber raid. As the new four-engine bombers came into service, a greater weight of bombs could be directed against the German cities. Air Marshal Harris had the problem of keeping up the pressure while at the same time avoiding heavy losses. It has been well said that commanders who cannot sleep do not last. Harris and I managed to sleep, with very few exceptions, because we knew very well that before a raid went off, everything possible had been done to ensure its success. We could do no more. And in fact, the less we fussed and bothered people, the better. The Germans had over 500 night fighter pilots, whose increasing toll of British bombers created grave problems. <laughs> One such was Wilhelm Hergert, who received the Knight's Cross for bringing down eight bombers in one night. When I had to go in my plane, it was a good thing it was dark. My stomach was awfully sensitive. And when I came out of the plane, I disappeared behind the plane. And uh, pity there was not that little house with a heart on the door. You just had to do it in plain air. You just uh, knew you are right, whatever you do, because you were defending your fatherland, Germany. And I think our feeling in Germany was exactly the same what your feeling was when you had to start to fly over Germany. My um, chief recollection of this rather late period of the, after the war uh, is of um, rather playing a game, um, or thinking of it as a game on ops. One, one put oneself in the place of the, of the uh, German fighters or the German radar people who were tracking you all the way and they saw you going in a straight line. So you were therefore um, immediately corkscrewed, weaved, lost height, turned 10 or 15 degrees port or starboard and uh, I flew that way practically from, uh, from take off to target and home again. It was hard work but at least uh, you felt you were making it more difficult for them.
So it was a terrible game, always, like playing cat and mouse. Uh, but it was very, very serious, uh, because life you could lost. Uh, the game atmosphere came in again then, because I remember quite distinctly saying to, to the gunners, now look, I'm going to fly into the old flak bursts. Uh, I suppose on the principle that um, lightning never strikes twice in the same place. It really was the, the flak and the searchlights that were the most frightening, particularly the blue master searchlight, which was uh, radar controlled. And um, once that had locked on to your aircraft, there was no means of getting rid of it other than by getting out of the area. And uh, to sit in a cone of searchlights at 20,000 feet was a pretty naked feeling. In July 1943, the Royal Air Force struck at Hamburg in the most devastating attack yet mounted. Command tried every means available to confuse the enemy defense. Great success was achieved with the radar blinding use of window. A mass of foil treated paper strips released to cloud the German radar screens. 700 bombers dropped incendiary and block busting canisters of high explosive in an operation grimly codenamed Gomorrah. It was frighteningly successful and a cold chill went through the fiber of Germany following the raging firestorms that consumed 15 square miles of Hamburg's built-up surface. In four consecutive attacks, 45,000 men, women and children perished in the burned-out ruins. American bombers interspersed the night raids with day raids and gave no chance to the fire and rescue services to reorganize. Nine hundred thousand refugees fled the city in two days, carrying the story of the cataclysm to all parts of Germany. Bomber Command had dropped nine thousand tons of bombs on Hamburg, nearly a quarter of the total dropped the previous year over the whole of Germany. The cost was eighty-seven bombers, and it took the city five months to regain 80% of its production. Most disappointing was the fact that the civilian morale had not cracked. German defense leaders saw in the ruins of Hamburg the eventual fate of all German towns. Hitler refused to visit the bombed areas. Hitler was not a friend of air defense at all. He didn't like defense. His complete intention was to be offensive, to attack. And he did never understand when I tried to make understandable to him that we should first establish a roof over Germany to protect the German production and then under this roof of air protection start another more productive machinery. At last, the bombing offensive had a tangible success. German production was switched to fighter planes and home defense weapons. Germany was going over to the defense. As in Britain, the people seemed to gather their resolve through tribulation.
It was the turn of the American flying fortresses to strike with precision attacks at the targets specified by the bombing directive. Priorities had already been changed from U-boat yards and pens to the destruction of the German aircraft industry. It was judged that the Luftwaffe was a greater menace to future Allied operations and had to be eliminated whatever the cost. Chief objective of the 8th Air Force bombers was the important ball bearing works at Schweinfurt and the Messerschmitt aircraft factory at Regensburg. Thank you. 